welcome you tonight. I know it's just a moment or two early, so we'll just talk for just a second and we'll get started as a few more folks may show up. Does anyone need a prayer guide? Does anyone not have one that would like one? All right, again, we have started sending them out to everyone that's in our email directory. So if you're not receiving them and would like a digital version of the, of the prayer guide, uh, please let Miss Denise know in the church office. If you will email us or call us, uh, we will get you on that distribution list. But we have taken our database of 3,000 people, 2,971 to be exact, and, and every email that we have an email to now is receiving our prayer list. So there may be a great homecoming. I don't know. We'll see. But if you would like, if, there you go. If you would like that, uh, we were going to make that available to everyone. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your desire to receive the prayer list, and we'll continue uh, to send those out. A lot of prayer concerns to discuss tonight. So let's open in a word of prayer, and then we'll get sharing some of the prayer needs of our congregation. Let's pray together. So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of this evening. We thank you for the blessings we have to gather as the body of Christ, to do the work that you have called us to do, to be servants that are prayerful for the needs of others, that are looking out not only to our own interests, but considering others more important than ourselves. As we lift up so many prayers for our sick and our hurting, our aging, those that are maturing, our homebound, our elderly, that are not able to weather the weather, that are not able to make it to the church, that are not able to drive any longer. And, Father, for those that are having significant health issues, sicknesses, Father, we're grateful to be able to pray for them this evening. We thank you for those that are back with us, for Miss Chessie being recovered from her COVID. And we thank you for Miss Dora and Clifton and them being back with us tonight. And, Father, we just continue to pray as you've called us to do as your people. Be with all that we say, all that is shared, and all the requests that will be lifted up, Father. May your peace and comfort go before us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a few praises. Miss Chessie, if y'all haven't met her yet, can I introduce her to you? She is right there. She is back, y'all. So what a praise to have you. And if y'all didn't hear that, everybody said, we know. So Miss Chessie, it is great to see you. All right. We also have Miss Dora and Clifton are back doing better recovering feeling a whole lot gooder so we're glad to have you all with us today brother joe you have a praise there you go and you said it was 29 again is that right okay lord forgive us there you go there you go all right so thank thank you for those that are back with us any, any prayer, let me share with you a few that we have on our list. Again, Miss Chessie is on our short-term prayer needs on the right. We're moving that to a praise. I want to ask you to please pray for the family of Connie Hensley. That's Carol and John Berg, uh, Bregel's sister. She did pass away this morning in Florida, so they're on, they were already on their way down there. Uh, she has a long battle with health issues. Uh, I believe she was 96 years old, having some issues with dementia. She was a believer, uh, is a believer, so Carol... Carolyn and John are, are comforted by that, knowing that we will meet again one day uh, in heaven. So please continue to pray for them. Also, keep their vehicle in your prayers. I know they've had some tr trouble with their brake systems and some other stuff, and they've made it to the campground and they're traveling. But I did tell them that we would come get them if need be. Uh, so please keep them in your prayers. I also want to ask you to please continue to pray for Danny and Wanda Tuttle. Uh, they have tested negative for COVID, but they do have the flu. And they're very tired and just energy. Uh, and so please keep them in your prayers. Uh, Danny and I talked today. So just the flu, but the flu can be bad enough. Also want to ask you to add Miss Lisa Andrews uh, to your prayer concerns. She is my aunt, my father's sister. She was in a very significant car accident yesterday and life lighted uh, to the hospital. Uh, thankfully, she has gone home already. Uh, she got hit by a tractor trailer. And about two more feet, the highway patrolman said, two more feet in the driver's side, and she probably wouldn't be here with us. Uh, but she's doing much better, and she went home yesterday. And her name is Lisa Andrews. I also want to ask you to please pray for Phil and Norma Kraus. Many of you know them. They're longtime attenders of our congregation. Uh, but their great nephew passed away yesterday. Uh, I believe it was yesterday. It might have been the day before. Uh, they're on their way uh, to Florida, I believe it was Florida, where they're headed to also for, for 
the ceremony events that will be taking place on Saturday of this upcoming week. Uh, so they'll be leaving, I believe they'll be leaving on Friday. So if you would please pray, pray for their travel mercies as well as that entire family. All right, and we have other requests from the congregation. I'll open it up to the floor. Yes, ma'am, Miss Linda. Okay, so they're, they're in the South Carolina area? They're in South Carolina? Okay, and that was Phyllis Hall? All right, thank you, ma'am. We'll lift up Miss Phyllis Fall for respiratory infection in her time in the hospital. Saw some other hands up? Yes, ma'am, Miss Nancy. Okay. All right, Miss Becky Dixon. All right, we'll lift her up. Becky Dixon for cancer. Any other praises or prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Patsy. All right, for those of you, do, do, how many of you don't have a clue what Ms. Patsy's talking about? All right, here we go. We get to brag on Ms. Patsy and what a wonderful ministry. Uh, so all of our Sunday school curriculum that gets used, whether you write in it or you don't write in it or whatever you've got, as the quarterlies expire and we're done with them, they get boxed up. And Brother Ernie comes and he picks them up in bulk and he takes on the task of getting them redistributed to people that will be able to use them. They get sent to different countries, from what I understand, right, Miss Patsy? What else am I missing that we need to share? There you go. So a good way to recycle kingdom, kingdom resources so they're in good hands. So thank you for that. And if you have some laying around and don't need them, don't want to use them, please get them to Miss Patsy or consolidate them. Where would you like them if we wanted to bring some to you? Okay. All right, thank you. Now, don't do that at the beginning of the quarter. Okay, That's after you've gone through the study. Okay, all right. And I believe they also take seminary books or any theological books that so we have people that are giving their libraries away and don't have use of their books? Thank you again, Ms. Patsy, for all your hard work there. All right. How many of you are glad to hear that's what we do with those? Isn't that good? Okay. Any other praises or prayer requests? You'll keep Brother Ed in your prayers. He's taking some vacation time this week, so he isn't blessing us with his charming voice tonight as we sing together. 
Uh, but he's called me today ten times wanting to know what's going on in the church. So I said, nothing. You're on vacation. So he said, thank you. Yes, ma'am. So a little health praise from Ms. Page. Wonderful. Thank you. Delmer, do you need to pray for Patsy? Yes. Okay. I know, Patsy, we're already praying for Delmer, so. And we're already praying for him. Yeah, yeah. There are pa I, I have a running prayer list for some men right here in my pocket. So I just keep it real close. All right, Etzel, there's another one, praying for Etzel routinely. Any other praises or prayer requests? Anybody want to share a praise from their Christmas celebration from their family? Delmer, go right ahead, sir. Okay. All right. That's if you'll notice he's on five thirty one twenty two, about the first six lines of your prayer list right in the middle. Daryl Cockrum. Right. He starts stem cell treatment on Friday in Virginia. Okay. Anything else? Nobody wants to say hallelujah for sixty degree weather on Thursday? Yes, sir. Okay, Miss Barrett. Parrish, Miss Parrish, all right. We'll add Miss Parrish to our list. A blood vessel in her eye. And a cut on her leg. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Students need to behave themselves a little better. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Folks, we're starting a brand new church year on Sunday. We've got a lot to accomplish over the next couple of years to reach our community with the gospel. And aren't you glad God gives us a fresh start every January 1st to do it gooder next time, right? So please be in prayer about how we can take our worship and to take all that God has called us to be and do in this place to a whole nother level that none of us have experienced before. I don't know about y'all, but... I would love to do something this year that I've never seen happen before. That'd be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah, all right. Anything else before we close and go to prayer? I got all night. Sermon's only seven pages tonight, so you'll be all right. No? All right, well, let's close and let's go to the Lord in prayer. So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of this time as you have heard your saints, your church, lift up many names, many comforts, many cares, many praises for what you are already doing amidst your people. Father, for healings that you've already brought, for science and technology and treatments for cancer and chemo and radiation. And Father, we thank you for the, the stem cell treatment for Brother Daryl as he begins that on Friday. We praise you for the medicine that you've given, the wisdom you've given to our doctors to heal physically. Father, we thank you for the privilege of praying for those that are, that are needing care for their health. We lift up Miss Paige Angel to you and pray for her improved health. We thank you for that as we have been praying for her. We pray for Miss Parrish and her blood vessel in her eye and the cut on her leg and her overall health condition. Father, we lift her up to you. Continue to pray for Miss Phyllis Faw and her respiratory infection as she's in the hospital in South Carolina. And Lord, we look forward to complete healing for her and comfort for her family and 
as we've already shared, Father, we thank you for the praise of having Miss Chessie back with us tonight and Dora and Clifton and the health that you've brought to, to our congregation. And we praise you for allowing us to get past the sickness and come together and praise and worship you. We continue to pray for the family of Connie Hensley, Lord, for Carol and John as they minister to the family during this time. We pray for your comfort. And as you remind us through your scriptures, the peace that surpasses all understanding that we have in Christ Jesus. To know that family and friends are comforted, that those who have died have put their trust and faith in Christ. Father, no greater comfort in a time and a season such as death than to know that the loved one has put their trust and faith in you. So, Father, we thank you for, for Carol and John, and we pray for your safe travel, safe travels for them, for your travel mercies to be upon them. And, Lord, we also lift up Danny and Wanda Tuttle. We pray for their health and healing and the sickness that they have with the flu and just give them strength and encouragement as they return to us uh, to worship this weekend. And Father, we pray for Miss Lisa Andrews, her continued healing. We thank you for the protection that you have upon her as she was not injured any worse in the car accident. Uh, Father, we pray for your healing upon them and for all things to work out uh, with the car and the insurance and all of those, those worldly issues that we have to face as a reality. Father, we pray for Phil and Norma Krause and, and the passing of their great nephew, just a young infant. Father, we don't understand certain things. But Lord, by faith, we know that you are in complete control. Lord, it doesn't often make it easier. Lord, we pray that you give the family comfort, give them the assurance that, of the faith that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, be with that family, and may they feel your presence. Lift up Miss Becky Dixon to you. Pray for her cancer. Pray for the treatments and the diagnosis and all that she is doing. And Father, we thank you for Brother Ernie and his passion to take Sunday school literature that has been used and to, to share that with others that are less fortunate, those around the world that we have a hand in helping their seminaries to have curriculum and the means to study the Word of God, even when they don't have the financial ability to purchase it themselves. We thank you for using this church and many churches like ours with the resources you've given us to continue to teach and educate and to make disciples of all nations. Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer now. We pray for your hedge of protection to be upon this congregation as we begin this new year. Father, we pray for wisdom and discernment and understanding and all that you would have us to do in this upcoming year. Lord, may this year pave the way for many years to come of ministry to this community, to our families, to those that don't know you. May we be bold in our proclamation, as Paul declared, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to have that boldness in our speech as we proclaim you to others. Father, help us to do it with love and truth. Father, help this church to be centered on your word this upcoming year that we may focus as disciples and observe, as you told us, to teach them all that you've commanded us. And Father, we pray for the discipline in our study, the discipline in our quiet time, in our reading, and our prayer. Our faith is not won by works, but, Father, the things we do are evidence and fruit of the faith we have in Christ Jesus. We thank you, as James reminds us, be doers of the word and not hearers only, lest we deceive ourselves. So, Father, we pray now for this congregation that this light will shine brightly in this community, that you would give us understanding or give us a heart and a compassion for others, that they may know and come to experience what we know the very reason that draws us together tonight in prayer, in fellowship, as family. Father, help us to reach out to others and share the good news of Christ. We thank you for this evening. Now we pray you be with all that is shared as we examine the cost of what it means to worship you, as we look at David's worship and David's sin, and Lord, how you pardoned him, and what it truly costs us to worship you. We thank you now. We praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Well, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to find your place in a little book known as First Chronicles. First Chronicles is one of those Old Testament passages that we don't read often, but there is tremendous treasure that is there that we can see when we do have the opportunity to study through the Old Testament. And tonight we're going to look at and examine what I have called in our message this evening, what is the cost of worship? Now, when you think about that as a believer in Christ, often we, we hear over and over and over again that God takes us just as we are. It doesn't cost us anything. Jesus paid it all, and all to him we owe. But in the reality of what Scripture teaches us, what does it really cost you and I to worship? 
costs us everything. And we're going to see through this text of Scripture some principles that we can apply to our own life to understand what does it mean to truly worship and to follow Christ. We have a culture of Christianity in America, in our Western influence, that I would argue is not a healthy culture. It is one that earmarks and, and begs to and, and pleads to consumerism, and I have seen it bleed over into the church in just my few decades of being a believer, where we often bring the consumer mentality into the church, and it's all about serve me, serve me, serve me. You ever heard when someone walk away from a sermon and say, well, I didn't get nothing out of that. I just want to be fed, Pastor. And I said, when's the last time you've opened your Bible? You know, the last time I checked, what was the principle? Teach a man to fish, and he'll feed himself for life. Give him a fish, and he'll always be hungry. Right? So I want to share with you some, some, some concepts and some principles that we're going to see in the Scripture as we work through our message tonight of, of an issue that David had with some sin in his life, some pride in his life, and what God showed him and what David's remark is in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verses 24, we'll go right to that text to begin with. And I want to share with you as you look and examine your Bible what David's recollection was when he decided to worship God with all of his heart and all of his soul and all of his strength and, and what was in front of King David. Now we're going to work through verses 1 through 30 and chapter 22 verse 1. So I hope you ate dinner tonight. If not, here's what I've learned. Dario is open afterwards. So we may be all gathering at the Dario for dinner tonight. All right, so I want to share with you tonight as we pick up, we're going to identify the cost of worship, and we're going to look at four things. If you'll go to my sermon outline, Tommy, for a minute, I'm going to share with you four specific things that we're going to examine in these 32 verses very quickly tonight. Of scripture. We're going to look at the parameters of sin and what David's sin was. We're going to look at the penalty of how God views sin, but we're also going to look at the payment of what God called David and told him he was going to do for that. And then we're going to see the pardon from the sin that was granted, the mercy of God. So let's pick up and read, and I believe we're going to read verses 21, excuse me, verses 1 through 7. Is that right, Tommy? Is that what we've got set up? All right, let's pick up and reading verses 1 through 7, and we'll go back and examine our text this evening. If you're there, say amen. Oh, come on. Y'all been eating too much pecan pie. All right, if you're there, say amen. Uh, we, we might be a hundred, but we can sound like a thousand, right? Picking up in verse one. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me a report that I may know their number. But Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not, my lord the king, all of them my lord's servants? Why then should my lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? But the king's word prevailed against Joab, so Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came back to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the son some of the numbering of the people to David, in all Israel, there were 1,100, excuse me, 1, 100 men who drew the sword, and in Judah, 470,000 who drew the sword. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering, for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. But God was displeased with this thing, and he struck Israel. Let's pray together. So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of examining your scripture now. As your word is proclaimed and it has been read, I pray that you prick our hearts. You challenge us where we've become comfortable in the things of God, and Father, you comfort us where we are in great challenge in this season of our life. Father, may your scripture speak clearly to our heart to understand what it costs us to worship you, what it should cost us to worship you. And Father, we know that cheap grace does not save. Father, help reveal to us what you expect and what you desire from your servants. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we want to start off, I want to share with you some parameters of what was going on in the Scriptures. We're going to see three specific things that stand out in these seven verses of Scripture. Number one, in verses one and two, we see that God detests evil. Can you say amen? Any kind, right? Folks, we live in a culture that has been so desensitized to the things of evil that certain things no longer even bother us anymore. For decades, I heard it said, if you want to change a generation, do you know where you start? You start with their children in school. 
You start with elementary school kids, and now they're starting with preschool children. And we desensitize them to the things of evil, and it becomes commonplace for them to the point that they don't even recognize what's going on. David, as close as he was to God in these first seven verses of Scripture, does something that Joab recognized as detestable to the Lord. Wouldn't even include Benjamin. Wouldn't even include Levi, the two tribes as he counted them. And David was boasting in his own arrogance and his own pride. You ever heard the term self-reliance? Now, our schools teach that often, and it's a good principle to an extent. But folks, when we are the children of God, we are not self-reliant. We are God-dependent. On all that we do and all that we are called to do, we need to seek God's face, and we need to seek living holy, holy, holy. God detests evil. In verses 1 and 2, we see that David's arrogance was before him. But secondly, we often see in three, verses 3 that God often puts sound counsel around us, but we don't listen to it. You ever had someone give you advice? It was good advice, but you had already made up your mind what you were going to do, and you didn't follow the advice of that person. And then only some time later, when everything unraveled and fell apart, you realized, man, if I'd have just listened to Cousin Bob, things wouldn't have turned out this way. If I'd have just listened to my mom, things would have been okay. If I'd have just listened to my wife, can I get an amen? Things would have been all right. But instead, we did what we desired to do, and we suffer the consequences of maybe that sin or that poor decision that caused pain and difficulty in our life. Folks, don't fail to look around you. You look around right now, God has put tremendous wise counsel around his children. You look left and right in the fellowship of the body of Christ, and we have one another to ask, hey, you know, Steve, I'm thinking about doing this, but I'm a little uneasy about it. I'm not sure. What do you think about it? How many of us would even do that and go to a brother? I remember James tells us in his, his letter, his epistle, he says, confess your sins to one another, period, so that you might be healed, period, for the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Too often, though, we're not even willing to go and talk to another brother or to another sister and seek the counsel of someone that can help us because of our own pride and our own arrogance. Here, David had good counsel in verse 3. Joab says, no, 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 no. Aren't you the king of all things? Everyone serves you. You don't need to count them. We serve Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God Almighty. Why would you want to do this, King David? But he followed through and counting at least a good number of those that were there. Don't neglect to understand, brothers and sisters, that God puts good counsel in our path, in the life of our church, in our Sunday schools, through our pastoral leadership, through our deacons, through, our, through those who lead in our church. We have an abundance of wisdom, of godly counsel to our left and our right. We just need to sometimes open our ears and be willing to listen. What a beautiful picture. But lastly, we see number three, that David's pride was evil in the sight of the Lord Jesus taught in our Sermon on the Mount about those who were humble in spirit, those who were meek, possessing the kingdom of God. And sometimes our own arrogance and our own pride will keep us from truly experiencing the presence of God. When we think we know the right answer, you know one of the greatest challenges for young pastors when they come out of seminary is their heads about this big with theological information that they've been pumped into for the last three to five to eight to ten years. And then they come to a church, and all of a sudden they think, I've got to open my head up and dump it all out on everybody all the time. And it's a challenge, isn't it? You can say amen. It is. Learning how to temper our pride and what we've been taught and what we know. I, I was sharing recently with a pastor. I won't call him out, but his name's Dom. That I'm reminded that we only know what we know because someone taught us. We had the privilege of going to a seminary education and, and learning. But even what we know now is not because of our own giftedness, however it might be, whatever educational ability we have and in intellect. But we know what we know because someone took time to expose us to it. We know what we know about Scripture because the Holy Spirit opened our heart and our mind to understand and comprehend it. 
We know what we know and we pen sermons and we do all these things, not because it's our own ability, but God gifted us to be able to do it. Lord forbid we ever become arrogant and prideful because of the amount of Bible knowledge that God has gifted you or me with, and we look down upon others because they don't know what we know. God is merciful and patient and just. What an example for you and I to not allow our own pride and our own arrogance, our own however long you've been teaching Sunday school. You ever seen that Sunday school teacher that their lesson and their time in their pulpit in their classroom is the main event of all that they do? Now don't misunderstand me. There's a time for teaching and proclamation of the Word of God and discipling our people. I went into a Sunday school class one time when I was serving as a, a lay associate elder pastor in a church, and the pastor had asked me to give announcements to all the Sunday school classes. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do whatever. You know, here I am. I'll carry the water, whatever's needed. So I go to the first Sunday school class, and I knock, and the class lets me in, and I share what the pastor wanted me to share with others. And then I went to the next Sunday school class, and I opened the door. And the Sunday school teacher looked at me like I had horns growing out of my head. Right at the beginning, y'all, this was like coffee and donut time. This wasn't like 15 minutes into it. And she says, get out. I, I just smiled. I said, she must be kidding. So I opened the door a second time, stuck my head in. And she said, no, I meant get out. You're interrupting my class. I thought to myself, wow, that's a challenging situation. What do I do? Well, I'm not going to go back in a third time. And I went on to the next class. Folks, we are blessed to do what we do because God has given us an ability. He has gifted us with a level of biblical knowledge that varies from believer to believer. But if we ever get prideful because of how much God has showed us or revealed to us, woe is me, and woe would be the wrath of God in my own pride and arrogance. The parameters of sin, David's arrogance and pride, but notice verses 8 through 15, we're going to see the penalty of how our sin often impacts the lives of others. Did you know that? That what you do in your own sin, while God holds us accountable for our sin, that our sin can often impact the lives of others? You ever heard of a child killed by a drunk driver because that person's addiction wasn't under control, they weren't able to control it, and they got behind the wheel of a vehicle and they killed another person? That sin impacted the lives of others. We're going to see how that impacted the life of thousands and thousands. 70,000 Israelites would give their life because of David's pride and arrogance. Pick up with me in verses, verses 9, and we'll read 9 through 15. And the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, choose what you will, either three years of famine or three months of devastation by your foes while the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, pestilence on the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of of the Lord, for his mercy is very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. Verse 14, so the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell, and God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw, and he relented from the calamity. And he said to the angel who was working destruction, it is enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. What do we see here in this penalty of sin? Number one, we see in verses 11 and 12 that God demands retribution for sin. We, we, we live in an era of fluffy Christianity, feel-good isms in church over and over. We still serve a holy and a righteous God who demands a penalty for sin. Aren't you glad that Jesus paid that penalty? But woe to us that take advantage of the grace of Jesus Christ to continue to live in our sin unchanged as if nothing is different. I would argue, I, I love the, the statement, once saved, always saved, if you're saved. If you're saved. If there's no change when you came to Christ, I would argue there was no salvation imputed to you. Because a man cannot continue to live in his sin openly with no remorse, no rebuke, no nothing, 
and call themselves a believer in Jesus Christ, which you are as a child of the devil. That's tough, isn't it? That doesn't, that doesn't tickle ears, does it? It doesn't make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. But that's the reality of how God sees sin. God demands retribution for sin. The reason Christ went to the cross of Calvary was because you and I would have no chance of salvation, no restoration in our relationship with God, no ability to even have our lips lifted up to our holy and righteous God to be heard by Him. What we would have is the penalty of our sin. The wages of sin is death. But what we have in Christ Jesus is someone who bore our penalty the propitiation of sin, meaning he took on our sin so that we who were sinful could be clothed in his righteousness. Others then suffer the consequences of sin as well. Notice verses 13 through 15. All those that now would be giving their lives, giving of their land, giving of all that they know because of the great sin that David, in this little thing called pride and arrogance, but yet it would cause a ripple effect across the community of Israel. I think our church knows well what it's like to have a leader fall and then the ripple effects of that impact us and impact generations of Christians. Number three, though, verses 15 reminds us that David tells us here that relying on God's mercy is always better than relying upon man's. Even in his just wrath, God spared David and God knew and had enough wisdom to understand that God's mercy is greater than that of man. David counted the troops despite Joab's displeasure. David's command was evil in the sight of the Lord. Israel paid the price for David's sin. God gave them three years of famine, three months of devastation, and three days of the sword of the Lord, a plague on the land, were the three choices that David had. But David recognized that the Lord was more merciful. Even Jesus reminds us that burnt offerings and sacrifices God does not desire. It is mercy that he desires. When we look at others that are in sin, that are bound up by that, when we look at them, do we look at them with judgment? Or are we reminded of John 3.17? For God did not come and send his Son into the world to condemn the world, for the world is already condemned. He came to the world so that it may be saved. Aren't you glad that you and I carry the message of the good news of Jesus Christ? Aren't you glad someone gave it to you? And that's the reason you're here tonight. That the Spirit of God, through the conviction of God and the calling of God, showed you your sin for what it was, and you recognized the mercy of God. That it was better to be in the hands of God than in the hands of man. He said, Lord, here I am, a sinner, saved by your grace. 70,000 Israelite men died because of David's sin. Sin affects everyone. Sin escapes no one. God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it, but relented and told the angel, Enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was standing at the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Now let me geek out for a minute and share a little history about who this man, Ornan, or Aruna, and the other sequel to this that we see recorded in our scriptures in 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles 21 uses the Hebrew form of Ornan for the Jebusites' foreign name. Jebusites, whose threshing floor was the scene of a, some significant events in biblical history. Jebus was the ancient city of Canaanite city, which later became Jerusalem. Aruna's threshing floor marked the place where the Lord stopped the pestilence angel after the death of 70,000 Israelites. The plague from the Lord had come upon Israel as a result of King David's prideful census and the instruction of the prophet Gad the repentant David purchased the floor and built an altar to the Lord there Aruna offered oxen and everything needed to the altar as a gift but we'll see in a moment David refused to accept the gift to worship God that cost him nothing Aruna and Ornan are both the same names of the same man that we see here and we'll transition and see him in verses 18 through 25 as we look at the payment for the sin We've examined the penalty, now let's look at the payment. Verses 18 through 25. Now the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. 
He turned and saw the angel, and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. As David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out from the threshing floor and paid homage to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Give me the site of the threshing floor that I may build an altar on that on it, altar to the Lord. Give it to me at its full price that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Ornan said to David, Take it! And let my lord, the king, do what seems good to him. See, I give the oxen for burnt offerings and the threshing threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for a grain offering. I give it all. Look in verse 24 with me, y'all. But King David said to Ornan, No, but I will buy them for full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David poured paid Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the site. God's demands a sacrifice for sin. Did you know that? God demands a sacrifice. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 21, we see that what did God do to cover the nakedness of Adam and woman? He sacrificed an animal. The first thing to experience death in the Garden of Eden. Whatever that animal was, we know the Scriptures say that God slain that animal and took their skins, and what did He do? He covered their nakedness. We see here that God also demands a price for the worship, a sacrifice for the sin of David. The angel of the Lord told Gad, the seer of David, what David was to do to go and worship. And I think there are some principles here that we can see. Number one, a sacrifice costs something. Verses 18 through 21, we see the the, the issue that's going on here. Now imagine this for a minute. Let me just put it in common text. King David and the angel of the Lord's there. Ornan sees it. His four sons see it. They They bow down and pay homage to the king. Now if you know anything about this culture, this would not be like if our president walked by us today. Okay, Totally different scenario. When a king in his time would walk by, whatever the king wanted... The king can have. Y'all with me? Notice Ornan's response was, King David, it's all yours. You can have it. Because he knew if the king wanted it, the king could just take it. He's the king. Ornan was ready to give them the oxen, and was ready to give them the the threshing sledges so they could build the sacrifice and the altar, was ready to give them the grain and all of that stuff. Ornan said, who am I? I'm I'm just a wheat thresher. This is King David. Bowed down and paid homage to him. And look at David's response as he looks to Ornan and he tells him in verse 24, I will not pay or give burnt offerings and sacrifices to the Lord that have cost me nothing. What an amazing principle for you and I that there's not only a sacrifice that costs something, there's a sacrifice that is very specific of what David was to do in verses 22 and 23. And the sacrifice is the evidence of the investment of David's worship. 600 shekels of gold David would pay to Ornan so that he could worship God with a pure heart. Now here's a tough question. Y'all ready for it? You sure? If you're not, just plug your ears. What does your worship to God cost you? Think about that for a minute. You reflect on that all week till Sunday. What does it cost you to worship God? Jesus Christ as Savior? That's a hard question. Because in our culture, it's all about me. I'm going to bless God with my presence on Sunday. Right? God, you should bless me because I showed up to your church. I blessed you with me. But in reality, when we look at the way David viewed this and understood it, he had the right to say, give me everything, Ornan. I will take your oxen, I will take your threshing floor, I will take everything you have because I'm the king, and I'm going to sacrifice it to the Lord. He could have did that. But I think David was a little shell-shocked. He was a little shy of making another mistake after this great prideful census that he had taken, and he knew, I better play this one right. I will not offer burnt offerings and sacrifices to the Lord that have cost me nothing. What does your faith cost you? What do you give up 
in your walk with Christ. That otherwise, if you weren't saved, if you weren't given the gift of salvation, the gift of God's grace, what is it costing you to be a follower of Jesus? What cross are you carrying because of Christ? I'd argue today our backs have gotten weaker than they've ever been in our culture, including in the church, not in just our church, but in general across America and across the Christian church, across those who profess Jesus Christ as Savior. Many have yet to experience what it costs us to worship Christ. For the last several weeks, we've been talking about our Lottie Moon offering. And a little interesting history, in the very beginning of our Southern Baptist Convention's foundation, I think it was 1864, Lottie Moon herself sent a letter to the Southern Baptist Convention's pleading for them, pleading the Southern Baptist Convention to take up an offering to send missionaries around the world to have the financial support. Lottie Moon's offering didn't start with WMU. It started with Lottie Moon herself, who knew the cost of worship as she gave her life to share the gospel with missionaries in China, or as a missionary to China. What does our worship cost us? Now, I don't share that with you to make you feel bad or make you feel like you're not doing enough, but I think it's a healthy examination for any of us that are followers of Christ in the comfort of society that we live in. I mean, i got a steering wheel heater, y'all. I mean, I drove to church tonight in a car with heated leather seats. We've got all the creature comforts. I've got a fireplace. I can turn a remote. Con- it's awesome, y'all. I can hit the remote control while I'm sitting in my chair and turn the fireplace on. It's like mind-blowing. That's the world we live in today. I've got like five different flavors of coffee creamer in my refrigerator. How many of y'all had to throw out more Christmas food and desserts and cookies that you just couldn't eat? Threw it away. That's the culture we live in. What does our worship cost? What would it cost us to follow Christ in such a sacrificial way that we would make an impact in this community, in the generations of your great, great, great grandchildren if the Lord tarried? What investment would we be willing to make to see your great grandchild, who's not born yet, come to Christ? What conditions could we set if we were truly sacrificially giving to God that would pave the way for some two-year-old that doesn't even speak yet when he's 18 to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Now, don't misunderstand me. I completely get God is sovereign over all those things. Election, predestination, God's sovereignty over the salvation of man. It's completely His, but guess what? He's called you and me to tell others about it. He's called us to pave the way, to set the offerings and the sacrifices to be made so that others can enjoy and can know the same Jesus that you and I know. What does our worship cost us? There's a penalty for our sin. Jesus paid it at the giving of his life. What did Jesus pay for the sin that he did not know, for the child that was born of a virgin, as we've spent the last five weeks talking about the Messiah and all these candles representing peace and love and joy, hope, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus born in a manger. What did it cost him to give you and I our salvation? It cost him everything. What does David say to Ornan? I will not offer burnt offerings and sacrifices to the Lord that have cost me nothing. What's it cost us to worship Him? There's a payment for our sin. Jesus reminds us to take our cross, pick it up, take up our cross daily. But let's examine verses 26 onward as we see the pardon from sin. And we're going to see that even though sin is forgiven, there are still residual issues that will take place. That's a Time for another sermon message, but I will share with you just a little bit of that as we examine these verses. The pardon from sin, picking up in verse 26. And David built there an altar to the Lord and presented burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. 
And the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offerings. Now, this isn't the first time God has answered one of his people on the mountaintop and brought down fire from God. We don't have time to discuss Elijah tonight and what he took place there, but we know that God will often answer that way. Verse 27, Then the Lord commanded the angel, and he put his sword back in its sheath. At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him at the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness, and the altar of burnt offerings, were at that time in the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before to inquire of the God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. And look in chapter 22, verse 1. Then David said, Here shall be the house of the Lord God, and hear the altar of burnt offerings for Israel. Well, we see here this pardon from sin. David recognized what was going on. David was afraid, and David offered the atonement for his sin in verses 26 through 27, just as Jesus offered the atonement for our sin. David would offer this atonement, and God would respond by affirming that his sacrifice and his offering was acceptable to God. You ever think about our sacrifice? You ever ask yourself that question? God, is my sacrifice to follow you acceptable? Sometimes I'm accused of being naive. Although I'm an educated guy, sometimes I think the best of people. Sometimes I don't think through certain things because I believe when God speaks to us, we just do what he tells us. Isn't that a principle? Right? When God speaks, we listen. And I was sharing to my wife, we were talking about the last six months of our life. It's been like a whirlwind. And the last 90 days have been just crazy, blessed but crazy, busy. And we moved all the way up here from a a place that we knew that we had raised our kids and a home we raised our kids. And I told her today, I said, I didn't even think about what we were doing coming here other than God's calling on our life to come and serve his church in this place. I didn't think about location. I didn't think about what it would cost us to come here. I didn't think about the difficulty that we would ensue. Y'all know how hard it is to put pickets in the ground and fence posts? I got a horse. Anyway, another story. But didn't even think about all that stuff. My naivety, perhaps. But wouldn't it be nice to think that when God calls us to do something, we just do it because we know God has called me to it. God has given me this responsibility And we will do whatever it costs to fulfill what God has called us to do. Wouldn't that be a beautiful way to look at our life as a Christian? Whatever it costs, God, here I am, send me. And that wonderful Isaiah chapter 6 passage, when we see Isaiah respond, the Scriptures tells us that the Lord has said, Who shall we send and who will go for us? Y'all remember that? Y'all been in church a couple days. You've heard that, I'm sure, right? You notice God wasn't calling Isaiah by name? Often we want a Shazam moment with God where he speaks your name audibly. Or you just know with 100% certainty he's speaking to you. Isaiah didn't know that. Isaiah overheard the conversation. Isaiah recognized the opportunity when the Lord said, Who shall we send and who will go for us? The plurality of the Godhead there. And Isaiah said, Here I am, Lord. Send me. I'm reminded often God didn't call Isaiah by name. Isaiah heard the opportunity and said, Lord, I will serve you if you want me to go. Don't wait for God to shazam you with a call. If you hear the opportunity to serve him, you hear the opportunity to sacrificially give to him, recognize the opportunity and seize it. Carp diem, right? Seize the day. No, God gives us all those opportunities. It's not always crystal clear, but if the heart is willing, the body will follow, and we will follow him and worship him. The offerings atone for the sin, and Jesus provides the atonement for our sin on Calvary's cross. The fellowship offerings provided the evidence of restoration that David had for the sins that he had committed. There was evidence in the life of David. There was repentance for his sin. There was an offering, something he gave up. Today, our fellowship should be the evidence of our salvation. What we do for Christ, the holiness of our lives, should be evidence, proof. 
You ever heard someone ask you if you were standing before a court today and you were being convicted for being a Christian? Would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you of your faith? Would someone else be able to get up on the witness stand and say, Brother Joe, I know he's a believer. He's, a, he's one of them people to book because I saw him do X, Y, and Z. I know Steve. Steve's one of those people. He was here and he did this and he did that. Would there be enough evidence to convict us in our life that we're a follower of Christ? Do your neighbors know that you're a follower of Christ? Do they know you're a believer? Y'all, I, get, I have fun with it now. Because I don't let everybody know I'm a pastor. Now, YouTube and social media, that's kind of taken away some of my fun. Because visitors come to the church and they already know who I am. I try to sneak up on them and just be average Joe. And then they get surprised when I'm preaching to the pulpit that he talked to me. I don't know why, but I don't tell my neighbors I'm often a preacher. I tell a few minutes into their conversation. And I can tell real quick whether they're saved or not. At least the evidence that they're demonstrating. Then when I tell them I'm a preacher... It's interesting how the language gets cleaned up a little bit. A little conviction, a little Holy Spirit conviction coming, right? God makes his restoration apparent, the building of a temple that David would desire to do. And notice in verse chapter 22, verse 1, And David said, Here shall be the house of the Lord God, and here the altar of burnt offerings. Folks, let me share with you a picture. Just go to that last photo for me. This would become the site in Israel that the temple mount would be built upon. Often we miss this in, in this scripture, and I never saw it for years until I studied it deeper. And folks, this would be the place, this encounter, this, this issue of pride and arrogance, not Bathsheba, not Uriah, not the sin of adultery and murder and all that stuff that had happened before. But here, David's pride and arrogance of being the king, being in control, this would become the place in the encounter with God where David would recognize the cost of being a follower of Yahweh. And it would be this very place in chapter 22, verse 1, that David would declare would become what you see in that bottom right-hand picture, where the dome of the mosque, they say it's not a mosque, it's a mosque, right? In Israel, where it was built. This would be the historical reckoning in the place where the Mount of Ornan would be, the threshing floor of Ornan, where David would desire to build the temple for God. Now imagine what God could do when we encounter him here in a way that we understand what it costs us to worship him. Maybe 2,000 years later, if the Lord tarries, there will be a marker somewhere in here in Stanleyville that will be vibrant and thriving. And when people pass by it, like when we look at that picture of Israel and we see Jerusalem, we can do what Solomon said in 1 Kings chapter 6, when he dedicated the temple, and he says, Lord, it's my prayer that when the foreigner, when the stranger, when the alien passes by this place, and they lift up their eyes and they see this temple, that they will know that you are the one true God. Imagine when people pass by this street. They pass by this church. They hear the name of First Baptist Church Stanleyville, and they immediately associate it with Christ, with God with holiness, with righteousness, with mercy, with justice, with love, with truth, with faith. Imagine what that will do to our community. Imagine what that will do when you and I now stand before God in just a few, few short years and give an account for our faithfulness in worship. What a beautiful picture. When we sin, God requires righteous redemption. When we're redeemed, we know the sweetness of the fellowship offering of God, and when our relationship is restored, we will see God at work in our life. God had a specific task for David. Unfortunately, David's sin would keep him from building that temple. He would lay the foundation. He would prepare the way for Solomon to build it. But because of David's sin, there were certain things that God would not allow David to do that he desired. Solomon would end up building that temple. Solomon would have his own share of issues and falling away from the Lord. But sometimes our sin has eternal consequences. But aren't you grateful that Christ Jesus saves us from all sin? When he saved you, he saved you from the sin you were in. 
He saved you at the moment of your sin. He saved you for the sin that you'll commit. And he'll save you, brother and sister, from the sin that you're going to commit before you leave the parking lot. Now, we don't want to desire that. Don't misunderstand me. We should not desire to sin. But the reality of it is, each and every one of us will sin. Some sooner than later. But we serve a God that already knows our frail condition. Already knows the issue in our heart. And he's willing to forgive us even now when we sin. Repent of your sins and be saved, the gospel says. What a beautiful picture. So what does your worship cost you? I hope you reflect upon that question as we ponder that this week, as we gather together on Sunday and we start our new year to worship him and understand what does it mean to have a new beginning in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of the reminder of David's account with Ornan and the sin of pride and arrogance. And, Father, we're reminded that you require a sacrifice. You require mercy and justice. And, Father, we pray now as your people that you would probe our hearts, that you would seek our hearts, that you would find if there's any wicked way that is within us. Father, reveal it to us. Help convict us of our need to be holy, holy because of you. Father, help us as a church to have understanding of what you'd have us to do and how we could serve you. Father, remind us that our worship of you costs something. Father, pray that you give us direction, wisdom, and discernment. How do we reach this community? How do we strengthen the lives of our church family? How do we disciple our grandchildren and our children and our children's children? Father, how do we become faithful in our season of, and walk with you? Many have been Christians for years and years, still struggling with the same sins. Father, I pray that you give us strength and the ability through the Holy Spirit to overcome that sin or to put it behind us, look forward to what you'd have us to do. Father, may we hear the opportunities and may we respond faithfully. Here I am, Lord. Send me. We thank you for this evening. I pray your hedge of protection to be upon each and every brother and sister in this congregation, Father, to our sick and our homebound, our shut-ins. Lord, we pray you comfort them through a phone call, through a visit, just through a word, Father. May they see your presence. May they know that you're there with them. Father, we thank you now. We ask you these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, have a wonderful eight week. Ed told me I had to sing for y'all to close, and I said I will not. Maybe later. But God bless you. Have a wonderful, have a wonderful rest of your week. I'll see you next year.